the reality is we're not we're not here on a whim. We're here to confirm what we already know. I already collected some DNA from you that you got rid of before. And so uh, I'm telling you, Jerry, I already know that your DNA is going to match the, the DNA that we have on file. Just one there, but I got rid of. How, how would we get your DNA at the crime scene there, Jerry? I don't know. Test it, see if it is. No, 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 we did. In 1979, Michelle Martinko was a fun-loving young woman of 18, youngest born of two daughters to Albert and Janet. She was raised in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, a quiet, sleepy little town. At the time, neighbours left their doors unlocked, safely walking in and out of each other's houses. Although crime was on the rise, no one expected the earth-shattering news that would devastate their small community for the next four decades. Michelle was an above-average student. Popular with her classmates and teachers, she was part of the choir, theatre and baton groups at high school. Very beautiful, vivacious, bubbly and outgoing, Michelle was loved by all. In the early evening of the 19th of December, Michelle had been attending a choir banquet. She asked a friend if she wanted to come to the newly built West Elm Mall with her. She was planning on paying off a jacket her mum had put a deposit on as a Christmas present for Michelle. The friend declined, so Michelle goes on her own, driving the family car, a Buick Electra. After trying the jacket on, she realised she no longer wanted it and put the $180 back in her purse and continued on to visit friends that worked in the mall. The last friend she spoke to was Kurt Thomas. When Michelle is ready to go, he walks her to the nearest exit, closest to her car in the car park. She will give Kirk a little smile as she leaves. This will be the last time anyone will ever see Michelle Martinko alive. At approximately 2am, Michelle's parents, now frantic with worry, call the police and report their daughter missing. Her dad, Albert, will go on his own to look for Michelle while Mum Janet stays waiting at home. At the same time, Cedar Rapids Police will also be out in search for Michelle. Around two hours later, at approximately 4am, they find the family Buick. Michelle is still inside, slumped in the passenger seat footwell. She has been stabbed multiple times to the face, neck and chest, with defensive wounds to her hands and arms. She is fully dressed with her purse and money still inside the car. The medical examiner will determine that Michelle has been stabbed over 29 times, primarily to the face, and that there was no sexual assault. Despite this vicious, frenzied attack, no blood is found outside the vehicle, apart from on the driver's side door handle left behind by the perpetrator. The entire crime happened within the car. Police are baffled as to the motive of such a harrowing murder. Remember, in 1979, there are no cell phones or CCTV as there is today. They find glove impressions, but nothing else. In the coming weeks, police will investigate over 200 leads from people responding to police appeals. A juvenile was found with a knife but ruled out. A mall employee was also interviewed at length as he admitted he liked following young women at night, but also cleared. It came to light months later that a mother of an employee of the mall 
had driven by the car park on the night as her daughter often had car trouble. She had said there were only two other cars in the car park, one of which she was sure was Michelle's, and that a man was standing at the driver's side with the door open. She hadn't come forward straight away as she saw this at 2am and had thought the incident happened hours previous at 10pm. She had told the daughter of the Public Safety Commissioner, expecting it to be passed on to police. It never was. She went to police herself months later. Police bring new appeals with an artist impression released. The police did think about charging the commissioner for not passing on important information, but never took action. It will take 27 years before there's a break in the case. In 2006, a cold case investigator chances a long shot, sending Michelle's bloodstained dress away for analysis. Startlingly, they find an unidentified blood DNA sample. It is entered into the National DNA Data Bank, but there is no hit. Their two prime suspects, Michelle's boyfriend Andy Seidel and her friend Kirk Thomas, are asked for DNA samples. Andy gives his immediately and he is cleared from the investigation. Kirk, however, is advised by his wife, a judge, and his lawyer not to give a DNA sample to police. He becomes their prime suspect. After many arguments and legal wranglings, he finally gives a DNA sample. Surprisingly, it is not a match, and the police feel they're almost back at square one. Over 125 people of interest were swabbed for DNA. Still nothing matched. In 2018, the DNA phenotyping company took the DNA and put it into GEDmatch, a public genealogy website that has been used by law enforcement to solve other cold cases, most famously the Golden State Killer. GEDmatch returned only one person who shared the same markers with the suspect in Michelle Martinko's murder and determined she was likely the killer's second cousin, once removed. Going back from this common ancestor, they find Jerry Lynn Burns. Police uncover that his wife Patricia died of suicide in 2008, and his cousin Brian Burns went missing on December 19th, 2013. He's never been found. Although police are suspicious of both incidents, they don't think Burns is involved in either. Burns has his own powder coating business. He was brought up in Manchester, Iowa and still lived there. After he throws straws away from a soda he has been drinking, police pick it up and send it away for a DNA test. The straw was a match with a 1 in 100 billion chance it not being his. On the 19th of December 2018, 39 years almost to the day after Michelle's murder, the police confront Burns at his workplace, alone in his office. We kind of know going in that this is probably going to be a match. Oh, really? Yeah. Why would that be? The reality is we're not... We're not here on a whim. We're here to confirm what we already know. I already collected some DNA from you that you got rid of before. And so uh, I'm telling you, Jerry, I already know that your DNA is going to match the, the DNA that we have on file. Just what the heck have I got rid of? How, how would we get your DNA at the crime scene there, Jerry? I don't know. Test it, see if it is. No, 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 we did. How would it be there, Jerry? I don't know. What happened that night? Wait for the test to come back. Jerry, we... I don't think it did. It did? I don't uh, think so. Okay. Did you murder someone that night, Jerry? Test the DNA. Jerry. Test the DNA. Why did this happen, Jerry? Test what, the DNA. What happened? It's possible. 
The trial begins on the 12th of February 2020. The defence will argue that the DNA was contaminated as all of the clothes were stored in the same paper bag together. The prosecution argued Burns had absolutely no ties to Michelle other than the DNA found at the crime scene. It shouldn't have been there at all, unless you were indeed her murderer. On the 7th of August 2020, after the jury took less than four hours of deliberation, Jerry Lynn Burns is convicted of first-degree murder and is sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. We are thankful that she fought so hard. Michelle played a critical role in identifying her own killer. The defensive wounds on her hand show it. She fought so hard that she was able to deflect the killer's knife so that he stabbed himself, leaving the blood that caught him. In a very real way, Michelle became her own best witness. Still, Mr. Jerry Burns was clever enough to steal 39 years of freedom he didn't deserve. 